uh, then we will turn to uh, the life of Martin Luther. Lord, uh, we thank you uh, again that uh, all truth is your truth and that whatever subject we study, uh, no subject is really a secular subject. There is no such thing. Lord, if we study science, whatever branch it might be, if we have open eyes to see, we see the wonders of your creation and the intricacy and beauty of all that you have made. Lord, if we study literature, words, we remember that Jesus Christ is the Word, the one who communicates. And we see how you gift people to use words and put them together in sentences. And we read one after another, and all of a sudden we're gripped by whatever it is we're reading. And then, Lord, we think of history as well. Uh, most of us, Lord, can remember history from high school. It was dry, it was boring, it was pretty much useless, and we were glad when the class was over with. But, Lord, again, history, not just in the Bible, but throughout all the ages, is, is really, if we look, is a story of your hand at work in the affairs of people and nations governing all things for your purposes and for your glory and for the kingdom of Christ your son so Lord as we uh, study especially the history of the church um, Lord as is true of any individual congregation so as a whole the church is a flawed well, can we say organization, body, group, because it's made up of a bunch of sinners. And so, Lord, as we, as we study the history of the church, we don't see this beautiful, pristine, unspotted, um, perfect history, but we see ordinary men and women who struggled, who failed, uh, like each one of us, but yet you use them, you fill them, you shape them, and for your own glory, you accomplished your marvelous purposes. So thank you, Lord, again for the privilege we have of gathering together tonight. Thank you for your presence among us. We give you praise and thanks through Christ our Lord. Amen. Martin Luther, as far as uh, the dates of his life, he was born in uh, November of uh, 1483, and he died in uh, the early part of 1546. The interesting thing about Martin Luther is there are more books about Martin Luther than about any other person who's ever lived in history except for Jesus, believe it or not. Uh, you know, we're, we're so familiar, we, we belong to a Lutheran church, we, we don't realize what, what, what a unique, powerful, world-changing individual he was. More books about Luther than any other person who's ever lived on the planet, except for Jesus. Uh, Luther is regarded as the greatest German who's ever lived. And there have been a lot of Germans of, of note. He's considered far and away the greatest. And, and I want to, to preface as we begin on just uh, in several minutes to look at his, at his life. I, I've quoted from um, Philip Schaff several times. And when I was in, in graduate school, my, my professor loved anything that Philip Schaff wrote. Um, and, 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 I, and I have a lot of his volumes in my, in my library. German Reformed um, theologian, church historian in the uh, 1800s, taught at a little seminary in Pennsylvania, Mercersburg. Um, but, but he wrote a magnificent, he died before he could complete it. He, he completed eight volumes and he got part of the way into the reformation before he died i mean so you think about eight volumes from the beginning up until into the 1500s he wanted to take it all the way into the mid 1800s never finished this mammoth work but but what he did write is, is amazing he writes with just a, a beautiful gentle spirit from an evangelical perspective a tremendous scholar and he begins volume number seven which is on the lutheran reformation by comparing uh, the coming of Christ into the world to Luther beginning the Reformation. That was very striking to me. 
And he takes Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And this is what makes his history book so beautiful and engaging because it's not just the, the dictionary kind of history book which is dry and dull. He brings scripture and theology and spiritual insight into it. And he said, you think about Galatians 4.4, 4, if, if you've been here over the past um, year or so, and I preach through Galatians. Galatians 4.4 4 says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent his son into the world. And when I, when I preached on that text, I, I highlighted that what does the fullness of time mean? The fullness of time culturally, educationally, um, politically, linguistically, religiously, whatever ways you wanted to think about it, all these things were brought together in a beautiful way over many, many years by the Lord until everything was as the Lord intended. And at that point, Christ was sent. Philip Schaff said it is exactly the same thing for the Reformation, is that God raising up Martin Luther was also, he says in the opening pages, in the fullness of time. And, and, and what he starts out with is, is saying, you know, when you think about the Christian faith, what is the Christian faith? And he said, it's a message of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a message that we're saved not by our works, not by the keeping of the law, not by being born into the church, as it were, but salvation is all of God's provision for us through Christ. It is all of grace. It's God's gift received by personal faith in the Lord Jesus. All right, so that's the Christian faith. And Schaff says when the Christian faith came on the scene, it wasn't well received by many people. Most Jews rejected the message because what? They equated tradition and scripture. Um, you teach the commandments of men. Remember Jesus said that? You teach the commandments of men as being authoritative as though it were scripture, as though it were the words of God. And so, so you have in, in the Judaism, when Jesus came, you have man-made traditions, and, and the idea of so many was as long as you're part of the outward covenant family, you're okay. As long as you're a descendant of Abraham, all is well. As long as you have the mark of the covenant, circumcision, all is well. What more could God expect? Religion was externals. And what Schaff begins with is he says, and I jumped inadvertently to, to number two here, but number one is at the time of the Reformation, the church had become exactly like first century Judaism. And the point that he makes is, what was the church like? It was filled by a lot of people who thought religion was found in externals, just like in the first century. It was a, it was a, the church was, tradition is authoritative as is scripture. In fact, tradition interprets scripture or even twists scripture. And that's what it was in Jesus' day, the great weight of, of human tradition. In, in, in Luther's day, if you were part of the outward church, all is well. If you're baptized into the Christian faith, all is well. Just like, you know, you're circumcised into Judaism, you're part of the, the outward Jewish faith, all is well. And, and so Schaff argues uh, that the church of the 1500s, the attitudes in the church, among the leadership, among the hierarchy, significant parallels to what the Jewish faith had become at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Externals, works, trusting in your heritage, all of these things. And, and so in the fullness of time, as Christ came into the world when that was what marked Judaism, so these are the very same things that, uh, if you will, mark the Christian church. And then he turns to conditions in, in the world that, that he sees as being similar between the first century and, and the 16th century. And, and I'll just mention some of these uh, briefly. I'm not going to really develop any of them. He talks about the ease of communication. Um, in, in Paul's day, in Jesus' day, the Mediterranean Sea was pretty much of a Roman lake. And, and communication in the Roman Empire for ancient times was marvelously good. In fact, the, Ro the, the Romans built, if I remember the number, something somewhere around 50,000 miles of roads. You think about that, 2,000 years ago. And in fact, you have the statement, what, all roads lead to Rome. In ancient times, they pretty much did. The empire was connected by this marvelous 
a marvelous set of roads, 50,000 miles of it. By the way, historians tell us the roads were so well built that it was not until the 1800s that Europeans built better roads from Roman times. In fact, I can remember when I was in, in Italy, in, in outside of Rome, the, the, the uh, Apian Way, which is an ancient Roman road, we were driving on it. Our guide said, you realize we're driving on a Roman road, they just put asphalt over it, so you're not bumping over the stones, but, but they haven't done anything to the road for over 2,000 years. It is so good, so well built, so well drained, the foundation's so great, they've just put asphalt over it, and buses and cars drive on it 2,000 years later. The Romans were tremendous road builders. Ease of communication. Well, in Luther's day, it was the printing press. We talked about that the other night, so that if you wanted to communicate, it's not that transportation, I mean, it, it was a, a definite setback from what it had been in Roman time. You couldn't travel anywhere as well as Jesus and Paul could have in their day. The travel was much, much better around the time of Christ. But the communication was found in the printing press. And, and so as the reformers would publish things, write tracts, whatever it might be, it could easily be put into print, and communication was very, very, um, what was easy as it was in the first century. Schaff says it also was a time of great unity. In the time of Jesus, everybody was one. You're all part of the Roman Empire. There is no other. There's nothing else. You're all Romans. In the time of the Reformation, it's the Western Catholic Church. There is no other. Everybody's part of Western Christendom. What else would you be part of? And, and so it, it's a time of, of tremendous unity. The Roman Empire, Western Christendom, European Christendom, all of Europe as one. It was also a time of, of learning and education. Of course, you know that in ancient times. Great culture, scientific advancements, study of mathematics, great literature, philosophers, all of that. And you remember, as we talked about last week, you have right before the Reformation, the Renaissance. Rediscovery of all these things. Rediscovery, reintroduction of learning and study on many, many different levels. And so the, the, the learning and education of ancient times is recovered in the Renaissance, and it's right there as the Reformation begins. Schaff says don't miss that connection as well. Both ages, he said, were times of prosperity and progress. The days of the Roman Empire, Jesus' day, it was a prosperous empire. Um, it was like America in many ways. They imported everything. They consumed the vast majority of resources on planet Earth. The Romans were wealthy. Uh, there was prosperity and progress on every hand, at least what you'd look at from a human standpoint. So it is at the time of the Reformation. There's discovery of new lands. I mean, all of these things. A time of, of new vistas being opened up. It's a time, just as in Roman times, of prosperity and progress. And then Schaff says both times the world was full of religion. You think in Luther's day, everybody's religious. You don't have secular people. You don't have people who don't go to church. That's why you got these monster cathedrals, because you needed big space to fit everybody in. The, Europe was immensely religious. And in Jesus' day, same thing. Everybody had his or her own religion. Not everybody was Jewish, obviously. But the world was full of temples and shrines and all kinds of religion. Nobody was irreligious. Nobody was an atheist. Nobody said, well, I'm not really sure if there's a God out there. Everybody was intensely religious in Luther's day and also in the first century. The world was full of religion. And then Schaff said, times of great need. He talks about the emptiness in people's hearts. Longing of the soul for something better. Is there something better than the emptiness of, of, of religion? That was true in the first century. That was true in, in Luther's day. Great need, spiritual need, emptiness of heart and soul. This was interesting. Both ages were prepared by forerunners. With Jesus... John the Baptist, the great forerunner. With Luther, we've looked at several of them. Peter Waldo, John Wycliffe, John Huss, Savonarola. Forerunners that God raised up until the moment is right and fullness of time. Both ages prepared by forerunners in various ways. 
Both movements, Schaff said, had humble beginnings. We know the story of Jesus, born in a manger, his family extremely poor, grew up in a little nothing of a town that was despised, Nazareth. Joseph was a carpenter, just lived in a very ordinary, low-class peasant family. And Schaff says the same thing for Luther. His dad was a miner. He was born in humble circumstances, peasant class, lived in a little nothing of a town. Both movements had humble beginnings. And then Schaff said both were, re were, were rejected by organized religion of the day. The religious leadership, when Jesus started preaching and teaching, they didn't welcome it. You know that from the New Testament. There was hostility. They looked for ways to catch him in his words. They wanted to destroy him, and they thought they did once they got him crucified. And you think about after Jesus ascended to heaven, it didn't get any better for the apostles. Read the book of Acts. Persecution, hostility. The organized Jewish faith of the day was the, were the severest persecutors in those early years. When the Reformation began, where did most of the hostility come from? Organized religion? The Pope, the bishops, those in authority? Both movements rejected by the organized religion of the day. And then Schaff finishes with this. He said, neither movement brought peace but a sword. And he quotes Jesus speaking about, I come to bring division, to set families at variance, one with another, Jesus says. And he makes the point that, that Luther, the message of the gospel, a, as it spread, it created dissension, even if you go into the later years of the Reformation, open warfare between various European powers over this matter of, uh, of, of the Reformation. And, and so Schaff begins his discussion of Luther in a very, very interesting way by, by saying, see the parallels between the introduction of the gospel and the recovery of the gospel. Because that's what Luther did. Luther didn't invent new theology. He recovered New Testament um, gospel teaching. And so Schaff says there are some marvelous uh, parallels. Just to show you a little map so you know, uh, when I mention different places, I'm not going to uh, point them all out on a map, but this is uh, an outline of modern Germany, and uh, if, if it weren't blurry, you could read the names of the different uh, German provinces today that are on there. But the area where Luther lived, where Wittenberg was, all these different things is in this red area right here. This, I, I entitled it Luther Territory. This is where most of what we're going to talk about took place. And if you remember the old map of West Germany and East Germany, it's all on the East German side because the border used to be between East and West something like this. And so it's all in the former East Germany and, and this is, so if you look at a map of Germany today, this is the Luther, uh, Luther territory. All right, so let's get, to, let's get the story underway. Luther was born in uh, <clears throat> the little town of Eisleben. And um, this is his uh, birth house here. Uh, you notice in the little caption, the original house was burned in 1689. You'll hear me say it more than once. I've already said it. The French burned it to the ground. The French like to burn stuff, I guess. Uh, but it was some of the warfare when the French invaded. You know how you would do in those days. You just you know, burn every town that you went through to the ground. Well, this house was burned down in 1689. And, uh, but reconstructed just, um, just four years later. So this is Luther's uh, birth house. Uh, he was born on the 10th of, uh, of November in uh, 1483. And uh, the very next day, his parents had him baptized on the 11th. And uh, this was the church he was baptized in, St. Peter's and Paul's church. And which, I, by the way, it was, it was under construction when Luther was baptized there. Um, so you think about being baptized in November in, in a church that isn't finished yet. Um, but this is, this is where he was baptized. And because he was baptized on uh, November 11th, that's why he was given the name Martin. Because it's St. Martin's Day. And so you were given the name of whatever saint's day was being commemorated. And so since it's St. Martin's Day, uh, therefore his parents gave him the name Martin. Uh, Martin Luther. So this is the church he was, he was baptized in. 
Well, early in, uh, 13, uh, in 1484, when Luther is uh, about seven months old or so, in the summer, early summer, the family moved to the little German village of Mansfeld. Here's a, here's a, obviously, it's a modern view with the cars and everything here. It's a view from the castle. Talk about a beautiful little town there in Germany. Uh, his parents moved uh, to Mansfeld, and the reason was is because in the 1500s, Luther's Day, uh, this was part of the mining region of Germany, and Luther's father was a miner. Um, he operated several very, very small copper mines, um, and he operated also a couple of small copper uh, smelting um, furnaces, and as he would make a little more money, he'd try to get some more furnaces, try to in, you know, improve his lot in life. But this was a little closer to the mining region, and since his father worked in copper mining, um, it was appropriate for Luther to, to, for the family to move there. Uh, here's Luther's childhood home right here in Mansfeld. So after he, the family moved there when he was about seven, eight months old, um, this is the house uh, as a young boy that, um, that he grew up in. Luther's upbringing was extremely strict and it was extremely harsh. Here's a painting of his mom and dad in later years after Luther became famous. Uh, the court painter in Wittenberg, in those days you didn't have photographers but you had court artists. And so since Luther was famous, let's memorialize his parents as well. And so this is obviously in later years, um, his dad haunts Luther, his mother Marguerite. Luther. Discipline, as Luther himself later said, was extremely harsh. He recalled this, this was later in life, he said, I recall that once for the sake of stealing a nut, my mother beat me until the blood flowed. Okay, you'd be in jail today if you did that. For stealing one walnut, he was beaten until he bled. That's the kind of discipline. He mentioned this about his dad. His father ruled the house with an iron fist. Uh, Martin later recalled this. He says, my father once whipped me so hard that I ran away. I hated him until he finally managed to win me back. So his upbringing was strict. It was harsh, but it was not unusual. That's how child rearing was done in those days. The father was the absolute authority and if a child steps out of line you beat him until he knows he better not do it again that was the training that was the upbringing and so even though I, what, what I read it's like wow they must have been really harsh parents every parent was like that extremely harsh there's a right and a wrong it's black and white you step out of line you won't do it again you won't do it again well Luther attended uh, school in, uh, in Mansfeld. Let me just go back to the picture of the town again. And the discipline there was also very harsh and strict. But it wasn't unusual. This is how, it, in, in those days, girls didn't go to school, boys did. And so in Mansfeld was a Latin school. All the teaching was in Latin, you learned the Latin language. And the discipline in the school worked like this. If you were a lower level student, we would say a grade schooler today. Here's how the discipline worked. In your classroom, you had the teacher head at the front, a slate with a picture of a wolf on the top. And that slate was there to keep track of every offense you committed during the week in class. And so if you committed an offense, the teacher put your name on the slate. And if there was something else that you committed, then there was tick mark number one and number two. However many tick marks needed to be put on that slate for the course of the week. And then every week, the, ch the teacher would check the record and see how many tick marks were next to your name. And for every mark next to your name, it, the teacher had a rod. And you got beaten with the rod once for every tick mark. Um, and, and I tried to look this up. I think I remember reading this some years ago that after you were beaten with the rod, however many times you had earned for the week, the teacher held the rod out and you had to kiss it. Discipline was extremely harsh. Uh, one morning, Luther got 15 spankings for the whole week. 
Um, and so, and, and, it, and, it, and it was a good sized rod. It wasn't like a little switch. It was a rod. These are grade school kids, if you put it in modern terms. And here's what would get your name on the slate. If you inadvertently lapsed into German, because this was a Latin school, so if you inadvertently said something in German, name on the slate. If you did it again, a tick mark. You could not speak German. Also, if you incorrectly conjugated a verb, you got your name on the slate. Like you think about the verb to be. You know, I am, he is, they are. Okay, you can do that with all the verbs. So if you're conjugating a Latin verb and you use the wrong form, Mark goes on the slate. Um, if, you fa if you fail to decline an adjective, uh, if, if you don't do it properly or you use the wrong gender for a noun, and Laurel will know this because she was a German major, every, every noun in German, for example, is either masculine, feminine, or neuter. And you need to know which it is because how you use adjectives and all these things depends on what the gender of the noun is and whether it's in the genitive case or if it's in the accusative or the dative case, whatever it is. And so if you were reciting in Latin and you used the wrong gender for a noun, a tick mark went up on the board, for example. Any kind of uh, profanity or language which wasn't proper, you got a tick mark. Any kind of misbehavior, if you nudge the kid next to you, if you talked in class, you got a tick mark. Also, you could get a mark where uh, during recitation period, so you'd have a lesson, you're all supposed to have learned the lesson, each of you would stand in front of the class one by one and recite. And whichever student did the poorest in the recitation, the teacher hung around his neck a wooden donkey because he was an ass hung around his neck a, a wooden donkey and you got a tick mark on the board besides because during the recitation you were the poorest kid at doing it and so that was kept track of and every the start of every new week however many tick marks you got you were there and the teacher took the rod and one week luther got 15 of them as a kid now you think about now you think about where we've gone today where you know students can curse out the teachers and you bring guns to school i mean we i mean talk about going to the other end of the, of the spectrum kind of an amazing thing and and so so and by the way I mention all this because there was a famous book written by Eric Erickson uh, kind of one of these Freudian uh, psychoanalysts called the young Luther and he argues that Luther's struggle with God and all these things has to do with this horrible education he got and his parents being so horrible he tries to psychoanalyze him you know he wrote it in the 1950s but this was Luther's background this was his upbringing. By the way, when you got a little bit older, they didn't uh, beat you with a the rod, they fined you. So if you talked in class, it's like five bucks, you know, whatever it would be. And so, and so your parents would, of course, be upset with you because they'd have to pay the fine because you weren't going to move on until you paid the fine for whatever it was. So if you conjugated a verb wrong or you slipped into German, it was monetary fines when you got older, uh, not the beatings when you were, like, when you were a grade schooler. So that was Luther's background. Very strict, very harsh, but not unusual for the day. Every student in school, that was what he would experience. In the home, that's what the young people would experience. A very different kind of, of world, uh, obviously, than, uh, than today. Well, in the spring of... Let's see, let me skip down. I put that over here. Uh, in, in the spring of 1497... Luther was 14 years old. His family sent him to the city of Magdeburg to, con to uh, continue with his schooling. Magdeburg wasn't a very large city in those days, about 12,000. If you've ever been to Fergus Falls, that's about the size of Fergus Falls today. And he was sent there to attend the cathedral school. There's the cathedral in Magdeburg. There was a school in Luther's day in connection with the cathedral. And the reason why Luther was, was sent there is because it was a better school. And his dad, having made a little bit more money at copper mining, had a little bit more resources, and like every parent wants to do, if you can send your son or daughter to a better school and you got the money to finance it, you do that. And so Luther was sent at the age of 14 to, um, to Magdeburg. Magdeburg was in Luther's day known as the miniature Rome. 
because there were churches and chapels and monasteries and priests and nuns and relics and sacred shrines everywhere in this, uh, in this small German city of Magdeburg. It was filled with all kinds of endowed churches and chapels. And what I mean by that is when you died, if you were wealthy, and of course you know you're not going to heaven because you're not a saint, but you're not going to go to hell because you're, you're baptized into the church. All right. So you're going to go to purgatory, maybe for a really long time. And so what you as a wealthy person would do is, is leave behind a large financial endowment and you would hire priests after you were gone to say masses for the dead, to say masses for you, because that's a good work and it's credited to your account. And by the priest saying masses for you, he will hasten your time out of purgatory and you can get to heaven quicker. And so there were a number of these endowed uh, churches and, and chapels. As I mentioned, the city was filled with relics. We talked about that last time. There were relic uh, to, uh, processions through the streets at least a couple times of a year where you'd parade you know, the bones of this saint or this garment that so-and-so had worn or whatever it was. You'd parade all these things through the streets for the adoration of, of the crowds in the city. Luther, uh, later in life, just recalls his, his year that he spent in Magdeburg. And he talks about a, a member of, of one of the noble families that, that struck him in, in a very profound way. Prince William was uh, the young prince's name, Prince William of Anhalt. Um, he was a patron, there was a Franciscan monastery in Magdeburg, and he was the financial patron of that monastery. But Luther says, I recall him walking through the streets barefooted, begging alms, because he'd given away his wealth. He had given away his position of prestige and, and luxury and all that. He'd given it all away. And, and Luther later recalled this, talking about Prince William. He had so fasted, these are Luther's words, he had so fasted, neglected, and mortified his body that he looked like a dead man of sheer skin and bones and died soon after that. Whoever looked upon him was deeply moved and felt ashamed of his secular way of life. And so Luther as a 14-year-old is thinking, you know what? That's what spirituality looks like. Uh, if you want to grow closer to God, if you want to be holier, that's probably the way you should go. And Luther said, as a 14-year-old, I felt ashamed of my secular way of life as I saw Prince William. Well, it was at Magdeburg that Luther discovered the Bible for the first time as a 14-year-old. Just think about that. He had never seen, had never held, had never read a Bible in his life at age 14. Ah, but it's a Christian country, isn't it? Never seen a Bible. Later uh, in Luther's table talk, and I, and I mentioned this the other night, is when Luther became famous and he would always invite students over for the evening meal and his wife is frustrated because he'd never, you know, ahead of time say, I'm bringing like eight students over, he'd just show up with them. Anyway, and, and, and even in those days, those students knew that Luther was going to go down in history um, as, as, as a man of note and significance. So at the dinner table, they would take notes on everything he said, on any number of topics. And he got to talking one uh, supper time about his experience as a 14-year-old in Magdeburg, and one of the students jotted this down in his notes. And, and here, I'll just read what the student wrote. When there were no public lectures, he, Luther, spent his time in the university library. On one occasion, when he was carefully examining the volumes, one after the other, so that he might learn to know the best among them. He happened on a copy of the Latin Bible, which he had never in his life seen up to that time. Then he noticed with great amazement that it contained many more texts than those that were ordinary, ordinarily preached on from the pulpits of the churches. You know, you have the assigned scripture lessons for each Sunday. You have an Old Testament lesson and an epistle lesson, gospel lesson. So Luther was familiar with the cycle of those texts, but he got this Bible. It's like, I didn't know there was so much more in there besides that. 
And so he, he noticed there were all kinds of texts other than those he'd ever heard talked about in church. As he was looking through the Old Testament, he chanced to see the story of Samuel and his mother Hannah, which he read rapidly and with great enjoyment and delight. And because it was all new to him, he began to wish from the bottom of his heart that our good Lord would at some time bestow on him such a book as his own. If only I could have my own Bible. Boy, and you think about, I, I was thinking, how many Bibles do I have in my office? How many Bibles do we have at home? How many do we not use? Because we have, you know, three others or four others. So you think about this 14-year-old young man never having seen a Bible in his life, never having read one, never having held one, and he comes across it as a 14-year-old one day when he's just going through the stacks in the library. He comes across it. He was so passionate about the Bible that later, by the way, when he became a monk, the monks in the monastery gave him his own red-bound leather copy of the Bible for his own. But he discovers the Bible at the age of 14. Well, after spending a year in uh, Magdeburg, his parents send him in 1498 to Eisenach, where he finishes out, we would say finishes out his high school years, if you put it in modern terms. All the courses, all the studies he needed to take before he went away to college. And so he was sent to Eisenach. We don't know the reasons why he was sent there, except historians surmise because there were different members of the extended Luther family that lived in Eisenach. That's probably why there was no family in Magdeburg and Hans and Marguerite, mom and dad, thought, you know, it might be better if he lives in a town where there's some of our relatives. And so they send him to Eisenach, and here is typical German-looking house, isn't it? That's the house where Luther lived while he finished his, his high school studies. While he was there... <clears throat> Luther, like other students, here's how you'd raise your tuition, because of course there were no public schools that were paid for by taxpayers. It, it's like uh, when we go to Kenya as a mission team, you have government schools, but they're not free. You gotta buy your own materials, your own pencil, you have to buy your own uniforms. Even, even today in a third world country like that, public education isn't even totally free. But in these days, so if you went to school, you had to come up with the funds and so what many of the students would do to raise their tuition and room and board, they would roam the streets of the town begging from the citizens of the town. And so what you would do is you would go down the streets and maybe you'd get a bunch of your friends, maybe three, four, five friends, and you'd knock on somebody's door and the door would be opened and, and you would sing, maybe you'd sing a hymn together. It's kind of like going uh, caroling at Christmas time. You come to somebody's door, knock on the door, Merry Christmas, and you, know, you sing, oh, come all you faithful couple verses of it, whatever it is. Okay, so you'd come and you'd knock on the door, and you as a group of students would, would sing for whoever opened the door, and then the, expe the, ex you know, the expectation was they'd give you something to eat because that helped with your room and board. Or maybe they'd give you, you know, a few uh, shillings or whatever it might be to, uh, to help with your, uh, with your expenses. Um, or else what you do is, uh, and Luther talks about how um, the students would shout this phrase. This is Latin. Is you'd come up to somebody's door and you'd cry out, panem, which is the Latin word for bread, bread for the sake of God, bread for the love of God, you would say as a young student. And so then the expectation would be that the wealthier citizens of town would, would, would have an interest in you as a poor, young, struggling student, and they might give you something to eat, some leftovers from lunch, uh, they might have a few coins that might help you on your way, whatever it was. And so while Luther was there, as it was with other students, uh, he engaged in the practice of begging. And, and he, he talks about this in a sermon in 1530, some years later. Uh, he's preaching a sermon on Psalm 78, uh, which says in part, speaking of the Lord, he commanded our fathers that they should make them, that is the things of God, known to their children. And he entitled his sermon on the duty of sending children to school. Uh, Luther believed that if you, whatever you had to pay, you needed to have your child educated because when you can read, you can read the word and you are a knowledgeable, solid, growing Christian layperson. So he preached a sermon on the duty of sending children to school, and, and here's a paragraph of what he said in this sermon. 
He says, it is true, as is sometimes said, that the Pope was once a student. Therefore, do not despise the boys who beg from door to door a little bread for the love of God, and when the groups of poor pupils sing before your house, remember that you hear, as this psalm says, great princes and lords. What he's saying is, so you have a kid who's 14 years old and he knocks on your door, bread for the love of God, or he and a little group of students sing something. Now they're just a bunch of kids. Luther says, as the old proverb is, remember the Pope was a student once. You never know what this young person's going to become. And, and so the idea is, so if they come begging, you don't know what this 12-year-old, what the Lord's going to do in his or her life in the years to come. And, and so Luther says, and then he says this. He says, I myself have been such a beggar pupil and have eaten bread before houses, especially in the dear town of Eisenach. Though afterward my beloved father supported me at the University of Erfurt with all love and self-sacrifice, and by the sweat of his face helped me to the position I now occupy. But still I was, for a time, a poverty student. And according to this psalm, I have risen by the pen to a position which I would not exchange for that of the Turkish sultan, taking his wealth and giving up my learning. If I had the choice of having all the wealth of the Turkish sultan and I had to give up my learning to get it, I wouldn't do it. But Luther says, be aware that when these students come to your door, these poverty students, you have no idea what's going to become of them. Support them. If they ask, give them what they need. So Luther himself says, I was one of those poverty students when I was in high school. Well, in, in the spring of 1501, <clears throat> he's 17 years old, uh, he goes away to college, to the university. And he goes to the University of Erfurt, and uh, in those days it was a fairly good-sized university. Even in Luther's day it had 2,000 students. And so he began his work there in 1501, working on a bachelor's degree in the liberal arts. And because you didn't have, like if you go to college now, I've got to take, you know, eight semesters. And I've got to take freshman speech, and I have to take English grammar. Okay, you didn't do that in those days. There, there were certain requirements to get your degree, and when you were ready to take the test to, to, to pass them, then you got your degree, however long it took you. So Luther begins in the spring of 1501, and he gets his bachelor's degree by the end of 1502, about 18 months later. He has his bachelor's degree. Uh, he wasn't the most shining student in the class. In his class, uh, getting his particular degree, there were 57 students. He was number 30 in the class. Bottom half of the class. Well, he pressed on, uh, and he worked for several years. In 1505, he got his master's degree again in the liberal arts, and this time he was number two out of 17 in his class. And after he graduated in February of 1505, he took a few months off, and in May of 1505, he began his studies in law school there at the university. He hated law, didn't want to be a lawyer, but his dad said, you're going to be a lawyer. Because his dad was a copper miner, for a while hand to mouth, hard manual labor, and just like today, if you're a lawyer, you'll make money. If you're a doctor, you'll make money. I mean, some parents think that way. And so Luther's dad was one of those, it's like, I want you to have a better life than I had. I want you to have a good income. I want you to rise higher on the social scale than I have. So you need to go to law school. You've got the ability to do it. And so... Luther, as a young 20-something, goes to law school because his dad said, you need to go to law school. Well, he's in law school for just a little over a month. And somewhere around the 20th of June, for reasons we do not know, he left in the middle of the semester and went home to visit his parents in Mansfeld. Again, the reason for that, we don't know. So he stayed with his parents not quite two weeks, a little less than two weeks. 
And it was time for him to go back and finish his semester studies at the University of Erfurt. And the date was July 2nd. July 2nd, 1505. He's on his way back from visiting mom and dad, and he's about four miles out of Erfurt when he is caught in a dangerous, horrific, violent thunderstorm. What do you do? Well, if he's on the road about four miles by a little town called Stotternheim, a massive bolt of lightning, here's the road, strikes right next to the road, right where he's walking in this drenching rain, and it is so powerful it throws him to the ground. It almost hits him. And as he's lying there in that muddy road, having been blown back by this lightning bolt that almost hit him, he cries out in terror, Help me, Saint Anne. I will become a monk. And the reason why he prays to Saint Anne is because Saint Anne is the patron saint of minors. And his dad was a minor. So if anybody's going to help him out, it's going to be the patron saint of copper miners which his dad was. So there, and so this monument here, by the side of this road, just four miles out of Erfurt, marks the place, you notice it's not real far from the road, where Luther was knocked to the ground by this terrific bolt of lightning. There's an inscription on the monument, you can see maybe a little, you can't really read it, and it's in German besides. But here's what the monument says. Geweite Erde, sacred ground, you know, you think about Moses and the burning bush or whatever it is, you know, where God meets you, sometimes in a very powerful way. Sacred ground, Wendepunkt der Reformation, turning point of the Reformation. This is what began moving Luther in the direction God wanted him to go. And then this statement, in einem Blitz von Himmel, even if you don't know German, you can probably figure that one out, in a, in a lightning bolt from heaven. Wurde dem jungen Luther hier der Weg gewiesen. In, in a lightning bolt from heaven, the young Luther was pointed in the way he should go. That's kind of the, how, how you maybe translate it. Help me, St. Anne, I will become a monk. So he gets to, to Erfurt, goes the rest of the four miles in this driving thunderstorm. And he gets there, it's like, I'm done with school. I made a vow, I'm going to become a monk. And so he has two weeks the next two weeks, he sells all of his law books. He doesn't tell his parents what he's doing, by the way. He, he doesn't dare. He, he sells all of his, his law books, and he thinks to himself, okay, so there are six monasteries in Erfurt. Which of the six am I going to choose to become part of? And Luther made his decision on this basis. Which monastery is the strictest? Which one demands the most of you? Because he wants to save his soul and find peace with God, and you better not be hit and miss with this stuff. So he picks out the strictest monastery there is in Erfurt. It was an Augustinian monastery. He joins the Augustinian order. Uh, and the Augustinian monks all uh, traditionally uh, dress in, in black. And so here is, the, here is the cloister that he becomes part, it's called the Black Cloister because the Augustinian monks all wore black robes. And so on the 17th of July, so July 2nd, the lightning bolt almost kills him. On the 17th of July, he's in the monastery. The night before he went in, he had a farewell party for his friends. They, they couldn't believe he was doing this because he was fun, he had a sense of humor. Uh, he loved to have good times. They loved to have good times with him. He had skills that he could have been a great lawyer. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing throwing your life away in a monastery? They couldn't talk him out of it. And after that farewell party with his friends the night before, he enters the monastery and begins a four-year probationary period. And his dad is angry. I spent all this money on your education and I had you set up to be a lawyer and you were in school and 
you dropped out and you're throwing it all away, what kind of son would do that? His dad was absolutely angry. So the question is, why did Luther take the action that he did? Well, a few historians over the years have said, you know, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of a, a spontaneous decision on his part. You know, he's walking along, he's in this thunderstorm, he's almost, he makes this rash vow, you know, he's almost killed by lightning. It's like, help me, St. Anne, uh, you know, if you get me out of it, it's like if you're in a foxhole. God, if you get me out of this, here's what I'll do. You know, some historians look at it, it was kind of that sort of thing. You know, help me, St. Anne, I'll become a monk. It was kind of a, a spontaneous, it was not premeditated. The, the lightning strike is just what, what, what sparked this. And Luther, having a fear of God, was not about to back away from his vow once he made it. Some look at it that way. But most historians say, very, very likely, Luther had been thinking about his relationship with God for some time, and he wasn't at peace. He was always serious when it came to the matter of the Christian faith, when it came to the matter of the things of, of God. He was extremely serious about these things. And that the storm and almost being struck by lightning was just like the final, that was just the catalyst for what he'd been thinking about. Because it hadn't been too long before where a very close and dear friend of his, about his age, had died suddenly. And Luther was terrified because I could have died. What if it had been me? If I were standing before God, what would have happened to me? He was terrified by the death of a good friend, because Luther's in his early 20s, 21, 22 years old. Yeah, you don't have 22-year-old drop dead, do you? And, and so he's terrified by the fact that, remember when I told you the story about Peter Waldo? One of the things that sparked his thinking about spiritual things was he was at a supper, if you remember me telling the story, with, with some of the leading citizens of town, and, and a good friend of his, a leading citizen, sitting just right with him at the table, fell over and dropped dead at supper time, and Peter Waldo's deeply shaken by that. What if it had been me? And so Luther had been thinking about these things for some time. And so when this lightning bolt strikes near him on the road, that is sort of the final catalyst that pushes him in the direction of, uh, of the monastery. Well, Luther remained a monk from the year 1505 until 1524. He was a monk for 20 years. The Reformation begins 15. 17, but he remains an Augustinian uh, monk for, for several more years. Let me tell you one, one more uh, story before we need to start beginning to, to wrap this up. May 2nd, 1507. Uh, by the way, if you want to read uh, a very good biography of Luther, that it's written in a very engaging way. It's scholarly, but it's not stuffy. It's, it's not uh, where you have to wade through it. It's not encumbered with footnotes. It, it's a tremendous book. It was written uh, by a Yale uh, history professor. I, I believe it was back in the 1950s, certainly at least by the 60s. Ro uh, Roland Bainton, and the book is called Here I Stand. If you want to read an engaging biography of Luther, read Roland Bainton's Here I Stand. It, it's an excellent, excellent book uh, worth the read. But he talks about this event on, on May 2nd of, of 1507. And what Bainton, as he tells the story of Luther's life, he says, in Luther's life there were three great thunderstorms. The first one is a literal one where he almost gets hit by lightning. The next two are figurative thunderstorms. On May 2nd, 1507 is the second thunderstorm, this time a figurative one. Here's what Baton says, it's another thunderstorm, this time of the Spirit. Because Luther is ordained as a priest, has been ordained, and now he is going to on this day celebrate his first Mass as a priest. And this was an awesome thing because in Catholic teaching, the priest, by the power given to him by ordination, has a power that even angels don't have. And that is to transform the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. Even angels don't have that power. 
And so this is already striking Luther, that he's going to be there, and when he says the words of institution, lo and behold, the body and blood of Christ. And so it's going to be his first Mass. His father came to the service, still not in a very happy mood. But he made a contribution to the monastery, so the monks were happy about that. But Bainton says for, for a priest, the Mass was an extremely sobering experience. And here's what Roland Bainton writes as he talks about this second thunderstorm. He says, the celebrant must be concerned, though not unduly, about the forms. The vestments must be correct. The recitation must be correct in a low voice and without stammering. The state of the priest's soul must be correct. Before approaching the altar, he must have confessed and received absolution of all his sins. He might easily worry lest he transgress any of these conditions. And Luther testified that a mistake as to the vestments was considered worse than the seven deadly sins. So your soul has to be right. You better not have a spot of sin on your conscience. Your, your vestment, your stole had better be exactly so. You'd better say the words. You'd better not stumble over them. You'd better not stammer. You'd better not say them too loudly. I mean, all these things. So, so here's Luther, plus he's got the power to transform bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, power that even angels don't have. So here's this young 22-year-old. He's getting ready for his first Mass. And so here's what, what Bainton says. Luther took his place before the altar, and he began to recite the introductory portion of the Mass until he came to these words. We offer unto you the living, the true, the eternal God. There's more to the sentence, but he came to those words. And then Luther later relates this. These are Luther's words now. At these words, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. I thought to myself, with what tongue shall I address such majesty? Seeing that all men ought to tremble in the presence of even an earthly prince. Who am I that I should lift my eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? The angels surround him. At his nod, the earth trembles. And shall I, a miserable little pygmy, say, I want this, I ask for that? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I am speaking to the living, eternal, and true God. So he's reading these words that he'd practiced many times, but all of a sudden we offer to you the living truth. All of a sudden, as he describes it, he was overtaken with an absolute terror, just as he'd been when the lightning bolt almost hit him on the road. He is absolutely terrified. So here he is. You know, his dad is there. All the monks in the monastery are there. This is a big celebratory day. This is his first mass. Bainton writes this. He says, the terror of the holy, the horrors of infinitude smote him like a new lightning bolt. And only through a fearful restraint could he hold himself to the altar to the end of the Mass. I mean, it was just by sheer self-will. He was shaking, he was trembling, he was terrified. It's only by a force of will he managed to make it through the rest of the Mass. A second thunderstorm. So here is Luther. You, you, you can see in, in what he says here is, I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I think I can approach God? How does that work? His holiness consumes me. And you see where Luther's struggle is. How do I know that I have a loving, gracious God? How do I know when I've done enough? How do I know when I'm holy enough? How do I know when I've tried hard enough? And he hasn't seen the light yet. It's several years in the, in the, in the future. But Roland Bainton says, this is a second thunderstorm of the Spirit. And it shakes him as profoundly as that very first thunderstorm did. And so you see Luther, 
a, a man of tremendous seriousness about these things. I mean, how many countless priests have been ordained and you read those words of the Mass and it doesn't strike you that way? But Luther, having a sense of his own sinfulness, how do I address God? This is a little bit off the topic, but I want to end with this. But just to think about, today a lot of times, I wonder how many people that we think are saved really are. My wife and I have talked about this. Because they bypassed Mount Sinai. They've never seen themselves as a sinner. They've never said, God, be merciful. I just add Jesus to my life. And nothing changes. A part of conversion is brokenness and repentance. And, and how many people have never come the way of repentance? What did Jesus say? Repent and believe the gospel. The very first words out of his mouth in the gospel of Mark. Now we say to people, oh, just trust it. Well, why? Well, because you need your sins forgiven. Oh, okay. Get a ticket to heaven. But, but, but is there that sense of I am lost and undone? I am dust and ashes. And if God treated me as I deserve, His holiness would consume me in an instant. I need Jesus. You know, what a difference it would make if, 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 if every person that says, I am a Christian, if their life were marked by repentance and faith. It's both. But a lot of times we, we, we point people, trust Jesus. But we never, and, and that's why Luther was so strong on, as a pastor, you need to preach the law and preach the law so people are like devastated in the congregation. Don't water it down and make it good news. But preach the law in all of its power and force so that you say to yourself, woe is me, I'm undone. I've got no hope. And then you say, no, you don't, but there's Jesus. Jesus. Will you receive him? And, and see, and, and so this is at the heart of the Lutheran Reformation is that point of coming to repentance and coming to faith. And how important that is, is that, you know, on a Sunday morning when, when people come here, yeah, we're, we're, all, we're all Christians, yes. But have we all come to that place of, of brokenness and repentance and faith in Jesus Christ? And like Luther said later, it's not a one-time thing. I repented of my sins 32 years ago in June. <laughs> no. It, it's, it's repentance. Yeah, there, there may be that day that you remember. And it, it's sometimes it's beautiful to hear somebody's testimony. It's like, I can remember the place. I can remember the time. Those are some beautiful testimonies. But that isn't the end of it. Lutheran theology says, so you repented 32 years ago. What about yesterday? What about today? What about tomorrow? That in Lutheran theology, repentance and faith are not one-time events, but daily events. And that's why some of the old Lutheran pietists, the old Lutheran revival folks of centuries gone by, they talked about daily conversion, which sounds kind of strange. I thought we only were converted once. Yeah, we are. But what is conversion? Repentance and faith. And that there needs to be daily, every day, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I trust Jesus again for myself today. That's conversion, daily conversion. And so Luther here, as he is an extremely sincere, religious person, but he has no peace with God. And he doesn't know how to get there. He doesn't know how to find it. But as the story unfolds, as, uh, as we will see, and, I, and I'm pretty sure we will get to it next time, just turning ahead here, how the Lord brought Luther to peace with God. And once Luther discovered, on what basis are you saved, it's not my righteousness, but it's Jesus. And it's trusting Him. Once he discovered that or rediscovered that, the Christian church was changed forever. And, and so... Lord willing, uh, next Sunday night we will get to that story of how God leads Luther over some struggles to come to the place where he is at the end of his spiritual rope. And he's struggling and struggling, and he's working with the book of Romans, and he doesn't get it. Until one day in his little office, the Holy Spirit opens his eyes, and he sees what it means to be saved. So it's, it's, a, tremendous, it's a tremendous story, and so I'm not going to move ahead with it now, but 
uh, but, it, but, I, but I want you to be encouraged and inspired. Luther was not just somebody like, we need to make a few changes in church. You know, I, I don't know if it's a good idea if we have a pope or not. I don't think we should. Um, maybe we shouldn't pray to saints. I don't know if I find that in the Bible. It's like, how do I know I'm right with God? That was his passion. And so I hope for each one of us as well, you think about people who need the Lord. That's got to be our passion. People need Jesus. They need to be saved. And let's not be afraid to tell them about the Lord Jesus. So let me close in prayer, then I'll take some questions. And then um, before I forget, next, um, next Sunday, because it's apple harvest at 6, for those of you that are able to, we'll meet at 4.30. So then that way we'll be done 5.30-ish, 5.40. And then if you'd like to stay for the apple harvest, we're not conflicting with it, we're not overlapping with it, we're not competing with it. And so next Sunday, 4.30 to 5.30. And then if you'd like to stay, there's the freedom to do it. If you need to go, uh, you can, but I don't want to miss a Sunday. Uh, just looking ahead, we've got, uh, what, two Sundays left in October and then I think it's three in November and then we're done and I just started Luther my wife will talk to me about like why do you get bogged down on stuff um, <clears throat> but but sometimes th sometimes that happens but anyway so I'll have to kind of gauge and, and try to watch my uh, watch my pace here so I don't get so bogged down uh, I don't get to uh, where I'd like to get on some of these things so let me lead us in a closing prayer and then uh, then free to go and those of you that want to have some questions we'll, we'll do that Lord, uh, thank you for uh, just the amazing way you work in our lives. Um, Lord, we think of as we just have begun a little bit on the life of Martin Luther, working uh, in his life in some very dramatic ways. Lord, I suppose for none of us in this room, uh, have you ever spoken to us through a lightning bolt striking near at hand? But Lord, uh, there's been ways that you've spoken to us, grabbed hold of us. Um, and Lord, you have changed us by your mercy and by your grace. So Lord, as we think about celebrating, not too many weeks from now, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we're not celebrating the institution of the Lutheran Church. That's neither here nor there. Uh, we're not celebrating historical events per se, but we're celebrating the fact that you, God, in your time and your way, raised up one person who proclaimed with great boldness, the just shall live by faith, who rediscovered the gospel, and who preached it and proclaimed it at the risk of his life, and the Christian church has not been the same for the last 500 years. So, Lord, we're part of that heritage. Whatever denominations we all come from originally, uh, it was all sparked by that one obscure German monk who said, what must I do to be saved? And so, Lord, thank you um, for the way that in these 500 years you've worked in many groups, a whole wide range of leaders, different denominations, uh, Lord, thank you that you are not tied uh, to one particular small denomination. You don't say, well, you as Lutheran brethren, you have it exactly right. I'm glad there's one little group that's right. But Lord, you, you work in and among your people in a wide range of ways, wide range of backgrounds. But how wonderful it is we have the same Lord, the same Savior, the same faith, the same hope. There is beautiful oneness, O oh God, in Jesus Christ. And it's because of the blood of the cross. It's because when we're saved, we become brothers and sisters. And there is a commonality that you can't explain. But you know it when you experience it. It's there. So Lord, I thank you again for this evening, for each one who has come. Blessings and peace upon us, Lord, in this coming week. We ask through Christ our Lord.